Sometimes I feel like my upstairs neighbor knows that I'm about to film and that's when they particularly want to start doing tap dances on the moon. I find it very rude, not mindful, not demure. My favorite part about that word going viral are the people that didn't know the word prior to TikTok. And that's both funny and very, very sad. I'm gonna need y'all to learn words. It's important to know how to articulate. But one upside is that I heard that the TikToker who made very mindful, very demure, popular, uh, has enough money for her transition now. And there's one good thing to come out of that, even though y'all have now already made me hate that word. Boyfriend in town and he's coming to see me. Hey now, hey now, Brazilian wax, hey. I don't get Brazilian waxes. I roughed my way through laser. There is nothing more humbling than having your butthole spread open and shot a laser inside of it in an effort to avoid ingrown hairs on your hoo-ha and your boo-ha. I'm sorry, hi, I'm Kendall. <laughs> If you are new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up, Home Scale Biscuit? And today we are finishing off, hopefully, everything that we need to talk about in the second half of this here Love is Blind UK season, the first Love is Blind UK. I did a video on the first five episodes already, as well as like first impressions of cast, yada, yada, yada. And also, if you're new to my channel, you would know that I actually do this pretty much whenever there's a Love is Blind or ultimatum that gets my attention. With that said, there were people that were saying, Kendall, we really need you to watch Love Island. USA because this past season was a mess and I don't know anything about Love Island so I'd have to be initiated but if that is something you guys want to see not right after this because we're already talking about Love is Blind so too much reality show one after another but if that's something in the future you want me to check out Love Island let me know but yeah I periodically pop on here and talk about either Love is Blind or the ultimatum aka the Netflix Lachey uh, cinematic universe of evil i have a playlist already of those if you want to check those out please feel free to do so and yes today we're talking about episode six through 11 or depending on when i'm done with this six through the reunion which would be 12. so we'll see what i can get done with by then so sit back relax listen to my opinion for those of you that have already watched it or for those of you that don't feel like watching it but just want to listen to me ramble about some that you don't plan to watch i think of both of you but before we get started, I'm going to send it over to a very funny sponsorship that I have this week. Like, absolutely hilarious if you know my very old lore. <laughs> but uh, we're going to send it over to Admiral Kenny. Thank you. Well, well, well. The day has come. Today's sponsor is none other than DoorDash. I have a history with DoorDash. It was one of my favorite on-demand delivery platforms back in the day. And they said, hey, let us bring you an offer you can't refuse. They said, Kenny, Kenny the Don, <laughs> Kenny, Kenny the Big Boss, Ken, Kenny, Kenny the Browse. We're here to show your viewers all the things we have to offer, not just delivering food from your local restaurants. I gotta stop, I'm so sorry. <laughs> not just delivering food from your personal favorite restaurant, but also behaving much like a personal assistant, picking up flowers, groceries, allowing yourself to be able to spend more time with friends and family instead of picking up that thing you forgot at the grocery store. For example, I threw a little get together the other day and DoorDash makes it easy to stock up on extra wine for the party, assuming you're 21 or over, of course, so that you don't have to leave your friends and family. You don't don't have to leave the fun. When me and my boyfriend were dying of seasonal allergies and neither one of us could leave the house because we were 48% snot, who was out there to get us allergy medicine from the local drugstore? Hello, it was delivered with DoorDash. When I am too busy and or too lazy to do it myself, DoorDash will be there for you in those moments. I gotta stop talking like this, but I started and now it's hard to stop. And I'm passing the benefits on to you on this, the day of my DoorDash sponsorship. I will stop. If you click on the QR code above my noggin and use my code Kenny50 to get 50% off up to $10 on your first order of $15 or more. Thank you DoorDash for giving me an offer I can't refuse and sponsoring today's video. And now let's get on to the departure. Okie dokie artichoke. Let's start off with episode six. If you recall last time we were here, Ollie and Demi were kind of making sense of their kind of like awkward interactions with other people. Particularly, they weren't the most lovey-dovey as everyone else and it had caused some concern to Demi as well as maybe the girls that had witnessed her out and about, but everybody else seemed to be getting along with their partners. If you hear a little like hacking cough, Russet is still here. She still has bronchitis. She is getting better, but they've said to me at least 
two more weeks of antibiotics. But she's doing fine for those of you that were worried. Thank you. But if you hear a little in the background, that's her. Yes. So that was the last thing that we had dealt with. And it seems like since then, Demi and Ollie have had a conversation trying to work that through, talking through whatever emotions she seemed to be going through at the time and really just being honest about how it's hard to see him interact with another girl who he had a connection with in the pods, even though she knows their connection is very, very strong. And he's very affirming and understanding. He's like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, that's very normal. That's very natural to feel those emotions. He's very affirming. I will say in this later half of the season, I really, really like Ollie. I do. I do. Initially, he gives this kind of like bros bro kind of vibe. Not because he says anything particular. Or well, yes, because he said some things like, I've been too focused on like appearances and like girls mad, yeah? Bodies mental. But then I realized that we're not compatible. Then now I'm focusing on the compatibility first. And it's just a plus that my fiance also has a fat ass. But I feel like in this uh, half, honestly, he comes off very neurospicy. <laughs> and I was like, He's actually quite nice, but definitely socially awkward and overwhelmed easily, which is hence why I started to feel like, huh, is this a neuro spicy brethren? <laughs> But the first part or the first conflict of this episode seems to be between Freddie and Kat. The confusion and the conflict comes up because they end up having a conversation about their past relationships. And she ends up asking him, has he ever cheated on anyone? Because she had been cheated on a lot in her past relationships and that's particularly triggering for her. And he's 100% honest with her and says, even though it doesn't make him look particularly good, yes, I did cheat on somebody before and it was a really long time ago and I really regret it. And all things considered, I understand why that's very difficult for her to hear. You know what I mean? Like, damn, the person that I really love had the capacity to do that at one point. And that's why I'm struggling and it's causing me pause to hear something like that. That's really hard to hear. She says like prior to this, she was very much in that mindset of like once a cheater, always a cheater. I was gonna say, you guys don't want my two cents, but that's literally why you're watching. It's called commentary, bitch. I don't agree with that sentiment of like once a cheater, always a cheater. I do believe that people grow experience, learn about themselves and others. And I think certain aspects of empathy and communication come from kind of fumbling in the dark at some points. And sometimes people cheat in that process. Now, I still agree that cheating is abusive. That's how I feel about it. I feel like it's an abuse of the relationship that y'all have. I've always said I have very strong feelings on cheating, particularly I think to knowingly and willfully cheat on somebody that's done nothing wrong with you feels like like an act of violence. Like it's an affront to the trust and mental well-being and the in the sanctity of whatever agreement y'all agreed on. It's a breach of contract. <laughs> and regardless of like what type of relationship you have, whether it be monogamous, poly, open, whatever, there is a contract with which you and your partner undergo to be together, whether you're mindful of that or not, and to explicitly disregard that and sneak around. I find it very malicious, but I don't believe that once someone one does that they can't ultimately see the harm that causes and then that caused them to never do it again in a future relationship. Though I am not in agreement with once a cheater, always a cheater, I'm very pro cheat on me once and thine shall never cheat on me again. I hope you go out. I hope you do learn and grow and don't hurt other people, but you ain't getting a second chance with my ass. Absolutely not. Be blessed though. And I'm not even being facetious when I say that. Like go out, truly, like go out, hopefully be better to somebody else, be better than, than you treated me. I hope you learn and become a better person, but I don't need to meet him. I don't need to meet that better person. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so they end up having the get together of all the couples. And this is where I find out that Ollie's also rich. Why is everybody so fucking ripped? Y'all ain't got shit else to do over there. But during this experience, we've started to... Who are you protecting? Bubba. But at this get together, we learn more of that trait that I picked up on last time about Jasmine being like someone who gets too into other business as an act of protection, but really you just being in 
business because Jasmine seems to be hyper focused on Demi because of the last time we were here she was obviously like struggling a bit with her emotions in regards to seeing him meeting Kat and so this led Jasmine to believe that Ollie was mistreating her or giving her unclear signs or you know whatever and so that makes Jasmine go into hyper protective mode which sure fine if he were actually mistreating her that that would make sense but he's not doing Doing that at least what we've seen all we've seen on camera is him being affirming and supportive and communicative albeit just not super pda heavy <laughs> at least on camera which doesn't stay constant throughout the show like in the later episodes he definitely seems to be touchier but even if he wasn't super into pda okay all right every couple is different but this seems to have really like triggered something in jasmine like if he treats you wrong i'll chop his dick off and it's like hey yo he didn't do nothing but it gets to the point that even jasmine wants to like confront him like go up to him and be like say how you feel like just own it if you want to be with her be with her if you don't want to be with her don't and he's like where is all this heat coming from like people are treating me as if i've like done you wrong and i haven't done anything wrong have you told people i've been doing you wrong and she's like no i just think people are reading like my body language and they know me to be a much more extroverted person and i'm like clamming up and shutting down but that's nothing you did but i think they're thinking it's his fault and again i think of it as is just a situation where Jasmine gets too involved in other people's business and also I get the sense like projecting her own traumas and jealousy and experience with her partner's cheating and she's projecting it onto Demi and Ollie's relationship. And I'm like, baby, she's grown. It's one thing to vocalize a concern or to check in. It's another thing to be in business like she doesn't seem to know the distinction. And as someone that works in mental health, I feel like you should figure that out, bitch. <laughs> One of the main things you are always talking about is boundaries, bitch. <laughs> but again, she essentially goes up to Ollie and she's like confronting him, so to speak. He gets kind of overwhelmed and he's like, I feel like I'm... I'm a villain here for some reason. I want to go home. Like I'm overwhelmed. I'm not like, I feel like some of the women here are combative against me and I've done nothing wrong. Or if I have done something wrong, I would hope I would hear that from you, Demi, and not these other bitches. <laughs> he don't say that, but that's how I understood. I'm like, damn, can y'all get the fuck out of people business? But he ends up going first, like leaving. And honestly, I get it. These piss me off too. That's how I felt about it. I'm like, hello? But it does seem to be that this season is a lot more fighting, or at least at this part of the season, a lot more fighting between the couples as opposed to fighting within the couples. It's like a lot of external factors that seem to be a hindrance at this point. And that's essentially what Ali says. He was like, I'm so happy that we did this experience and this experiment because obviously it brought me to you. But also at this point, I think we're getting to the point that, you know, we're not getting anything but hindrances from it. So I'm ready to go off this honeymoon island with these other couples and just be together and be alone. Speaking of which, it is that time. They're going to start with the cohabitation period, meeting the family, experiencing the world together, getting back phones, which is an aspect that I always forget. And this is where we get back to Jasmine and her kind of hypervigilance, because now that everyone's getting their phones back, she's like really cognizant of whether or not he's on his phone a lot. She goes on to say that social media has been a problem in the past. A lot of like following girls and liking pictures. I don't know if I've said this in another video. I probably have. This is one component that I really don't understand in a lot of conversations around modern dating because I could not imagine spending that much time and emotion going through everybody you follow. I'm just not. Are they commenting how they want to suck their titty on the beach and shit? Are they DMing people? Do you know that they're like reaching out to people and sending their new taint piercing? I don't know why I assume. <laughs> like, no, right? So if you don't have any actual evidence of cheating, why can't people follow people? I follow a bunch of fine and I ain't gonna unfollow them just cause I got a boyfriend. Why would I stop following people because I got a boyfriend? Why would I expect him to stop following people just cause he dating me? We can't look at fine mother What's wrong with looking at fine are you DMing them trying to like smash genitalia? That's another thing. But like just admiring that people are sexy. Why is that a crime? <laughs> why is this an issue? Some people, I guess when they get in relationships, they're like the only person that you should find attractive is me. But I just think that's unrealistic. There's so many sexy people on this planet. Why can't we acknowledge the art that lives amongst us? 
times, right? It just seems really exhausting to get that energy, like have someone like hyper focused on what you do online. And it also feels exhausting to do that. I don't know how live like this. This sounds exhausting, but okay. Like, damn, I can't trust you to have an Instagram. Then why are we together? If I feel like I can't trust you to have an Instagram. I can't trust you to be around the opposite sex or the same sex. I can't trust you to be around people. I'm like, what the f That shit's a full-time job. Hell no. Nah. And this episode ends with a hiccup between Tom and Maria, or Maria. Her family ends up calling her Maria, but he calls her Maria. So I guess both apply. But they end up having a conversation where it comes up what he may have thought of her after hearing about her career. And this is when I realized she's actually a makeup artist. That explains so much, baby, because her base is always spectacular just absolutely smooth bronze color matched to the gods really chiseled but natural it really shows that she's know what the f she's doing okay chef's kiss but for some reason this is something that he has to admit that he did look down on back in the pods when he heard what she did he looked down on it as i understand this he extrapolated that as a makeup artist she must be superficial i guess not as focused on a real career bitch do you know how much money celebrity makeup artists be making do you know how much a makeup artist can make what are you talking about obviously she's good at it look her at her skin but like people make products people work on shoots people work on movies people work as just artists and the art itself is something to be proud of i don't know that stupid <laughs> that's just how i feel about it i'm like you just sound real dumb because what are you talking about but i guess he assumes that she doesn't make enough money for them to have a shared great life or whatever i don't know what the f he's talking about but to me and to mario this just seems like exceptionally closed-minded for a guy that up until this point seemed particularly open-minded i mean damn how are you closed-minded about work but you as a white English guy started dating a Moroccan Muslim girl. You're more concerned about her being a makeup artist and not concerned about maybe some things that you might have to consider in meshing cultures and experiences and viewpoints together. You're concerned that she knows how to put on foundation. What? Anyway, episode seven. This episode begins, and this is kind of the vibe I feel for pretty much the rest of the show, with Kat and Freddy. And Freddy's like making jokes and like bouncing around a little bit. He also gives me a little neuro spicy vibes. I don't know. She is not taking that shit well. She is not receiving it. And in the interview, she ends up saying something along the lines of like, he's just so jokey jokey all the time. Sometimes I want him to be serious. And it makes me feel like he thinks of me as his friend and not his fiance. I really feel like a lot of people don't like their partners and it showed like as people y'all wouldn't hang out with this mother do y'all like your partners would you be friends with your partner like can y'all like what do you mean <laughs> you treat me like a friend not a fiance huh i don't under whatever again miserable speaking of miserable jasmine and bobby she brings up the social media thing i was talking about before again i assume she brings it up as like she has experiences with guys she's dated cheating through social media but again all she brings up is like they liked pictures and they were following women okay i don't know i just feel like if someone was doing this i would straight up say go to hell <laughs> If my boyfriend came up to me, I need you to stop following any like man that you find attractive on your social media. I would say go to hell. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? You can't control our follow on social. What the f <laughs> Even stupider, she ends up bringing up his past where he had a music video. Like he filmed a music video a few years back and he had a love interest in that music video. And it's like very romantic and they're on the beach and looking longingly and feeling on each other's bodies. And I'm like, did this bitch just bring up <laughs> a video he made prior to them meeting? What? But essentially she's like, I know it's in the past, but then why are we bringing this up? Like, what, what is this? Why are we talking about this? If not to give him pointers, cause the song kind of sucks, but you know, why are we bringing this up as if like, this is something we need to talk about. This thing you did four years ago where you were romantically involved with another woman it makes me feel some type of way. Again, girl, f you. <laughs> anyway, but he just kind of does whatever she says and that's fine, I guess. Okay, so this episode is where we start meeting friends and family. I'm gonna just breeze through Sabrina and Steven because it's boring and they're happy. Nicole and Benaya, he ends up meeting her family. It's boring, it's nice. Okay, in the process of like doing the meeting friends and family, this is around when I started to find myself really like an Ollie because he just seems easily distracted 
by lemons and he keep dropping shit, kind of goofball energy. But ultimately he seems to get along really well with her friends and later her family. But as like invested as he got in a lemon at one point, I was like, again, this is Nero spicy, ain't he? And that is when soon after he ends up like confessing that he has ADHD, which I find very funny as a fellow Atahita Brigade member. Baby, it's not hard to see. <laughs> But it seems to be something that he holds very close to his heart. It's a bit sensitive to him. So he doesn't tell a lot of people. So this is like a momentous moment where they're like sharing this thing. But I think she got the sense that that was the case anyways. <laughs> Catherine visits Freddie's house, which is suspiciously clean and feminine. Like a woman lives here or did live here not long ago. Like that bedspread. I don't know. More about Maria and Tom figuring out each other, like how to, to understand each other in their lives. Primarily cultural differences with her family. Like PDA is not a big thing in front of her family. It would come off as very offensive and not like the loving gesture that I think he would want it to be. He ends up meeting her siblings and her mom. They seem happy, but definitely concerned, understandably, about how quickly everything is moving, the process. You know, it's not very conventional by any means. There's tears and emotions, especially around Maria's father not being able to be there because of his passing. But all in all, it does seem like they seem open to Tom and willing to receive him into everything. So, hey. Kat meets Freddie's family who seem very, very sweet. And he goes up to his brother and asks him to be his best man. And that was, I, I watered up a little bit. I was like, Arr. but his sister does seem, I was trying to put my finger on who she looks like. Anna Nicole Smith. I just, I just got it as I'm sitting here. She looks like Anna Nicole Smith. Very pretty woman. Very, very like pretty woman. She pulls him to the side and like kind of vocalizes some concerns about everything checking in because he doesn't seem to be like behaving like himself. He seems very reserved and not his like normal, fun loving, goofy self. And they end up getting into like the serious conversation of whether or not he feels like he's enough for her. And she's like, well, is she enough for you? Have you considered that? Fair. Episode eight. So this is right before they're gonna do the meetup with everybody that was in the pods, even the people that didn't end up in relationships. And right before that, Benaya talks to Nicola. They bring up how he has a lot of like reservations about seeing Sam for the first time since the pods. Again, he does not have a great vibe associated with him. He thinks he's disingenuous. And his big fear is that, you know, Nicole is going to have the wool pulled over her eyes and forgive him and think of him as a good guy and Nicole is like you have nothing to worry about I just want to give him his ring and his bracelet back I want to just close that chapter give him his shit and then like never think about him or this again like at all and I think that would be very reasonable to be like okay that's the end of it yeah Benaya does not seem to want to let this go like particularly how much he dislikes Sam so I don't know if it's just him being like unreasonably combative in the sense of like this man is a non-factor at this point like you know what I mean or is it like something really heinous was happening off camera like what was he saying in the pods you know or in the men's quarters that really like he really don't like this <laughs> but yes we end up having the get together and tom ends up talking to somebody i forget who one of the guys about how him and maria had had a bit of a blip where they had gone out to brunch or breakfast or something and she had offered to pay and he's like oh thank you and then after that she got very like sullen and quiet quiet and quiet and when he goes to inquire what's wrong she essentially says like i can't believe you let me pay <laughs> because like if my mom saw you letting me pay she would be like very upset like especially in this early part of our relationship and i'm like what like one why the f did you offer <laughs> let's start there why are you offering to pay bills that you don't want to pay like that's stupid why did you it also sure this is technically the beginning of your relationship but you're engaged y'all skipped so many steps so like i don't understand there's not an initial courtship stage where like oh it's a first date and i want you to pay for the first date which 
I mean, I, I think I agree. Like the first date, I think men probably should pay. I don't know why. <laughs> it's definitely culture norms. But in the set of culture norms and how men seem to understand it under patriarch, there is something understandably perceived as rude to not do so on the first date. Like, I've, you know, don't get me wrong. I've done the little like reaching for my wallet. Like, oh. Let me reach for my wallet. Oh. But like, if y'all in a relationship, this is every day. You expect him to pay for things every day. Also, again, why the f*** did you offer if you don't want to pay? I think this is so stupid, but okay. And he's really thrown off because he's like, the way that my mom raised me, she would have been like deeply offended if a man wanted to pay for everything all the time. It feels very like minimalizing and belittling to her. So I'm like kind of shocked with these very like stark gender roles that she seems to have, Maria. And he'll kind of talk about this later. Like, I don't know how I feel about that being the environment that I raise kids. Anyway, everybody from the pods comes together. The ones that were engaged, the ones that weren't. This is where people will end up seeing people that they have never seen in person yet. Notably, one girl who they show a lot, but she doesn't say a word on camera, really. Her name is Charlotte with an S who's very pretty. And that seems to be the common understanding of her and her reasons for being here is that she's very, very pretty. Well, she is, she is very pretty, but the editing kind of makes it feel like this ends up becoming like a big conversation piece, especially amongst all the men. Like, oh, you've seen another attractive girl. Are you still wanting to get married to the woman you're betrothed to? Like one guy goes up to Ollie and essentially asks like, yeah, you don't feel a little different now that you've seen other women, which is what the f He's like, yeah, they're pretty, but like, no. <laughs> Like, this is the woman I love and want to marry. Like, I'm not concerned about other people. Like, what? But it ends up becoming like a bit of a conversation between Kat and Freddy where he remarks about, yeah, I think she's pretty. And he, I guess he brings it up twice, which is something that really bothers her. Again, this is another thing. We can't just admire that are attractive? Does it always have to be some like deeper meaning? Can not just be attractive? Cause as I was understanding it, he wasn't saying it like, ooh, I'm just trying to you know? It was very much so like the sky is blue, grass is green and Charlotte is attractive. Like, okay. It's no like intentionality behind it. It was just like, oh, okay. Yeah, I think she's pretty. Yeah, she's pretty. But Catherine takes it to her ego, obviously. And she's kind of like, how do you think that would make me feel? And I'm like, I. I don't know, how would it make you feel? I don't. And especially because as he brings up, when Sam makes his appearance for the first time, she ends up seeing him and apparently he looks a lot like her ex. And so that's something that she says repeatedly. I was like, oh my God, he looks like my ex. He looks like my ex, oh my God. And he's like, well, you brought up how Sam looks like your ex like 48 times, but I'm not over here sweating about it. Speaking of Sam, when he gets there, he tries to go up to Benaya pretty much immediately and Benaya is not interested in talking at all. Also, Sam kind of just ignores, Essentially, Nicole doesn't greet her or anything. And this rubs Benaya the wrong way as well. He goes up to Benaya and offers to chat and he pretty much declines outright. But later, Sam does end up going up to Nicole and it's very awkward and it's very confusing and weird, honestly, the conversation, but it, it felt like a lot of her just trying to placate him. Like, here's your ring, here's your bracelet. I did care for you in the pods. I did love you in the pods, but when we left, it just didn't feel right. He ends up bringing up how essentially is it because on those first two days, she wanted to initiate a physical connection, have sex. I don't know why I said it's so clinical like that. And he did not want to, he wanted to be a gentleman. I don't know how that makes you more of a gentleman, <laughs> like, but okay. Especially when you're f***ing engaged again. What are you talking about? This brought to my attention because somebody brought this up and I didn't even notice this last time. But when they meet for the first time, like out of the pods, they don't kiss. He does not kiss her, which is weird. No, I don't know. Anyway, but she's like, I just didn't feel it. It didn't work out. Here's your ring. Here's your bracelet. And they seem to end, you know, on amicable terms. Fine, whatever. But even despite that, Benaya can't seem to let that shit go. He's like, I don't like the idea that you came back and you're just like, oh, he's a nice enough guy, whatever. Like, he's not a nice enough guy. Like, I know how he was like in the men's quarters and I really don't like him. And she's like, I don't care about him. Like he's a non-factor in anything I feel about our relationship. Let it go. I'm not, like I don't give a f about him. Let it go. I burned the ever living shit out of my thumb yesterday. Gnarly dude, can you see it? Yeah, my battle scars. Meanwhile, 
Catherine ends up talking with Sam again, who she has admitted over and over looks like her ex. And she honestly is a bit flirty. And again, I am very pro giving pretty people the benefit of the doubt. They might not be flirting with you. They might just be pretty. But she is definitely flirting outright with that he ends up showing her the ring that he had gotten for Nicole. And she's like, oh, this is the one I wanted. The one he got me is a knuckle duster, which I looked it up. Apparently is a brass knuckles. What does that mean? Like the diamond's so small, but it doesn't even have one type thing. She was like, this is the ring I wanted. And she's like, yeah, next time you're in London, like we should hang out or whatever. And I'm just like, mm. and she was like, I've never cheated. I've never cheated. And I'm like, mm. you sure? Mm -hmm. Tom and Natasha talk and again reminder this is the first time they've ever seen each other in person I also recall that this was the other lady that he had a connection with in the pods but he broke up with her saying that he didn't feel any sexual like romantic feelings towards her they definitely had something that was more platonic but it seems upon meeting they do have a bit of like a flirtatious thing going on and again engaged to Maria I don't get the sense that Natasha is really crossing any boundaries per se she's just kind of like you know i think you're an amazing person i really enjoyed getting to know you i meant it when i said i fell in love with you and again it could just be how it's edited but it, it ends up turning into like yeah i'm on the fence with maria i'm on the fence with maria he, he speaks so tight like this because you know we're two weeks away from the wedding and there's still so much that obviously we still don't know about each other and we still need to work out to feel comfortable enough to be married you know, Benaya and Sam talk kind of, but at least the way it's edited, Benaya definitely comes in hot. He's like, I think you're disingenuous and I think you came in with ill intentions and I really care about Nicole, so I won't let you essentially disrespect her. And it starts getting heated going back and forth, yada, yada, yada. And Sam ends up saying something along the lines of like, you know that she wanted to sleep with me the first night, right? And I told her no. I don't know. I don't know what that has to do with anything. And Benaya is like, okay, another situation in which you are openly disrespecting her to me, idiot. I think that's pretty fair because why did you tell him that? <laughs> like, what the fuck? So after the event is over, the next day, Tom and Maria talk. He brings up Natasha and the conversation that they had had. And I don't know if he misremembers, misrepresents, or maybe there's like an edit uh, that we didn't see. But he basically tells Maria that Natasha came up to him and was like, I love you, which is not what happened, at least what we saw. She was definitely more so saying like, you know, I cared about you in the pods, which, you know, is fine. And like, I fell in love with you there. And I I think you're a great person. I didn't get the sense that she was trying to, oh, they were kind of flirtatious. There was definitely a chemistry there, but I don't know if she was outright trying to start something. She was like, I just want you to be happy and you seem happy with Maria and, and I want that for you because I care about you and you seem happy with Maria. So enjoy that. That's how I understood it. He kind of brings it to her as if she came up to declare her love for him. And it's like, that's not what happened. Why the fuck you lying? You sing it. I don't feel like singing it right now. Ollie meets Demi's family and that goes really well. I really like the way Ollie handled that. He seemed to pull dad to the side and really talk to him about how he wants to reassure him, especially because that's your youngest daughter. That's your baby girl. And I know how close you guys are together. So I want to like reassure you that I love her and she's in good hands and I and I want to answer any questions that you might have of me. And again, I really liked him doing that. I thought that was really cool. I haven't talked about Sabrina and Steven much because they must be happy. There's nothing to show. <laughs> they meet her family in Ireland and that goes well, but it does seem that they have a bit you know, some reservations because again, this is all going so fast, but that's to be expected. No more than you would expect anybody else to feel that way. And the episode ends with Freddie, the cousins, Freddie and Kat having a conversation in which they kind of talk about how they don't know how ready they are for marriage yet, specifically Freddie, because she's very snappy at him. And she's like, well, I care about you enough to assess it and change so that things are good. And he's like, well, it's easy to change those things for the two weeks weeks before we get married but like I mean this is important like fundamentally how we get on how we get on and how we make like the basis of our relationship and the problems that we'll have and we're we don't know how to handle any of that he ends the episode saying that he like how would she feel if he had a prenup 
Now, I don't know if I've said this in videos. I feel like something I would have said in a video, but I have no problem with prenups. I actually think they're a very smart and very considerate thing to do when going into marriage. Because it's not just like, you keep your shit and I keep my shit. It's a contract on what to do when the relationship ends in whatever way it ends. Because shit, if it's not in divorce, it could be in death, someone dies. We have a prenup to say what happens in regards to like wills and stuff like that. People's items, where does it go, yada, yada, yada. Sometimes it helps in regards to if one spouse had a lot of debt and that surviving spouse doesn't have to pay it now. You know, shit like that, kind of like, like legal finagle and and like who gets what and where it goes and so that things can be done as amicably as possible and smoothly as possible. But I, I don't know, I guess a lot of people will think of it as like, you're thinking of the end of the marriage before we've even started. It's like, no, it's just, I think it's being more considerate of it. Letting all of the like money and financial and the like things that can get in the way of the focus being on we want to be together. We're not going in to break up and get these things or whatever. It's the focus is us being together. And if we do part at some place, regardless of how sad or whatever it would be, we'll both be taken care of. And that's something that we've thought about understanding and hoping that we'll never have to do those things, but it's just being s smart. Like, I, just, I don't understand like why people feel, like some people think of it as very controlling. And I'm like, well, it shouldn't just be one person making the prenup. I think it should be two people considering what they want from the relationship. Anyway, that's my whole diatribe about prenups. But I will say, at least how this is edited, I would have a problem with how he does does this because essentially he says, I want a prenup so that in the case that I die, you get nothing and everything goes to my sister. Hello? Why? I can't get a dime? I'm your widow. I can't get nothing? What the f***? <laughs> and he's like, are you cool with that? And I would be like, no, I'm not cool with that. The f***? <laughs> like, what? And at this point, this is where I'm very much so at. He does not want to marry you. And I think to some degree, she knows that too. But like, what do you mean? I'm your wife. Hello? <laughs> Jesus. Anyway, episode nine. More meeting family. I don't care. Oh, Nicole meets Benaya's mother and sister who came in from Germany. And it would seem that this is going to be particularly emotionally taxing because after her breakup with him first, when she first picked Sam, he went back to his family and apparently the breakup had really crushed him. It like really hit him hard. And so his family hadn't, had never seen him like that. And so, you know, understandably, they're a little like this girl that hurt my brother who hurt my son. I'm like, who is this chick, you know? But, you know, Nicole handles that with understanding and empathy. Like, I do understand where I need to take some accountability, assuage any fears of his, of yours, because at the end of the day, this is the person that I want to be with and ultimately the family that I will be accepted into. Ultimately, it ends up going well, though, but yeah. More meeting family. Maria meets Tom's sisters. Freddie meets Catherine's parents. Freddie meets Catherine's friends. I will say, as we're going along, Freddie does not seem happy or excited. There's a lot of him saying like he has a lot of concerns about her difference in lifestyle. She seems to be very outgoing, wants to go to clubs and da 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 Might be a bit materialistic, according to him. And he's a homebody. He's not really very social and outgoing like that. And it concerns him that he'll, like their lifestyles will be able to mesh. And again, I just think this is another situation where he's just trying to figure out a reason to not marry her. He just don't want to marry her ass. Like, that's just how I feel about it. Bobby and Jasmine, we haven't talked about them a lot because honestly, as the show goes on, I don't find Bobby has any personality. Like, it doesn't seem like they really show much of him. And I guess, you know, ultimately, Jasmine seems to be a bit controlling and he's cool with being controlled. That's the vibe I get. So they like it. I love it. But this is going to be the situation in which he ends up meeting her mother, who is flown in from the Philippines and is batshit crazy. I don't like her mom. I'll just say that off rip. It shows where she gets her overbearing tendencies from and just straight up disregard for boundaries and takes protective to the place of like intrusive, arguably kind of abusive. Like Jasmine is a telling stories about her childhood where her mom like went through her phone and if there was a boy in it, she would call them and block them and say, never talk to my child again. And she's doing background checks on every man that she's ever dated and that she'll say hurtful things, but you know, that's just how she is. She also has a history as she'll talk about later of having two failed 
failed marriages. And that combined with, you know, Jasmine's history of infidelity. I don't know why those marriages ended. Perhaps that was also uh, some cases of infidelity. It would seem that in that process, they've created this relationship that is, I don't know if codependent's the right word, but definitely with the mom being too much in her damn business. See where she gets it from. And during this, Jasmine does want to articulate like, you know, if I'm getting married, you can't keep overstepping. I can't tell you everything. Like I can't tell you every argument we have, like, oh, he didn't put the dishes up. Like, I'm not gonna tell you an argument we had over a dishwasher. And mom is like, no, you need to tell me everything. I am your best friend. And she's also really judgy to his face. <laughs> like, this was wild to say, but um, she's like, where did you go to college? And he's like, oh, I, I didn't finish university. And she's like, and Jasmine is like, not everyone needs to go to university to make a career for themselves. But Jasmine's mom is like, yes, but it's very hard to communicate with an uneducated person. <laughs> Which as a person who went to a very annoying college that is very like up its own ass about how pristine it is and how intelligent everyone is that goes to it. There are so many people that can't communicate worth shit that go there, but know how to do math. Like, what are you talking about? Like, this, that is not, that is not how that works at all. Okay. They do the dresses and the suits. Don't give a about that. And then that's basically the end of the episode. So I guess we should do our guesses, right? So I have written down that I think that Sabrina and Steven will say yes. Ollie and Demi will say yes. Tom and Maria will say yes, but if not, Tom will be the one that says no. Jasmine and Bobby, yes, but he'll regret it. Freddie and Kat, no from Freddie, because that is not, he does not want to get married. It's like blaringly obvious. Benaya and Nicole, no. I have no sign for why. I just don't feel it personally. Okay, so episode 10. This episode, I don't really have much to say. They have the bachelor, bachelorette parties that are really dumb and nobody cares about that. Nothing juicy happens at this one, but they have it. And then they go over to the first wedding, which is Sabrina and Steven. They've barely been on screen. They got married. Shocker. I'm not shocked. I definitely saw that one coming. Maria and Tom. Notably, Tom's mom couldn't come. Well, not that she couldn't come. She didn't come to the wedding. That sucks. Apparently, she's just not supportive of any of this. But they get up there and I genuinely thought they were going to, you know, they were going to go for it. But Tom ends up saying no, because a, you know, essentially we haven't had enough time. It just seems like they had a lot of just views that fundamentally they haven't flushed out, which is... I think it's fair. I'd rather you say that than get married and you knew you weren't ready. Anyway, episode 11. This episode starts with Demi and Ollie's decision. Weirdly enough, Demi says no. I did not expect that. It was very funny when she said no, though, because he looked at her, not angry, but like cartoonishly like, huh? Why? And that shit made me laugh. And essentially, honestly, I don't think either of them really wanted to go. <laughs> I think both of them were very at the... I want to be with you. I don't want to rush into getting married. Like, I just want to be with you. And that's definitely the vibe because they were like very weirdly chill, both of them kind of about it. Like there was a few tears as you expect because it was like emotionally intense situation. But for the most part, they were pretty chill. About it. <laughs> so Bobby and Jasmine, right before the wedding, mom says some things, some of which are hurtful and would ultimately sow some seeds of doubt. Namely that she thinks that Jasmine likes Bobby more than he likes her that he's broke and can't provide for a family. And I'm like, damn, okay, shit. All right, what the f He had enough money for the drone shot in that music video. I don't know what he does. He might have a penny. You don't know nothing about people. Obviously you thought going to college meant that people know how to articulate, but they get up there and say, yes, they actually get married. So I was right with that one. Wait, I'm right at three out of four right now. Okay, not bad. Benaya and Nicole, honestly going into their wedding, neither of them look like they're ready to get married, but for some reason they both say yes. Okay. And then Catherine and Freddie, and Freddie says, no, thank God. Because again, that don't look like he want to be there. He hasn't looked like he wanted to be on the show for the last like six episodes, doc. I wish he would have just said that earlier, but most of the people that end up not getting married definitely have this vibe of like, we definitely plan to keep dating. I will say, honestly, I don't think they should really be together. <laughs> I think they've run their course, but, um, but yeah, 50% ain't bad. Half the couples got married. And at the time of recording this, the reunion isn't out yet. So I will update you guys when the reunion is out. All right. This is voiceover Kenny for the updates. As far as the reunion watched it yesterday as of recording this. And we definitely have some updates that I did not expect. First of all, Demi and Ollie did not end up getting back together, which I was confused about because I was like, 
they seemed like they would get back together, but they didn't. Um, essentially, Demi was like, he's a great guy, but he's not my guy. And I got to remember that we don't see everything in relation to these relationships. So maybe, I mean, they would know best if that's the best decision for them. Um, shortly after that, he started seeing Charlotte with an S, the really hot girl that people kept throwing attention to for some reason. Um, so maybe that's why, because they wanted us to know who she was <laughs> when he... Uh, started dating her. Well, they seem to be pretty vague about their relationship, him and her, but everybody seems to be on good terms. Demi's like, hey, maybe he wasn't my guy, but maybe he's Charlotte's guy. And everybody seems to be respectful uh, in that regard. So good for them. Two, the thing that really shocked me the most, Sabrina and Steven are not together. <laughs> Recall, they seem to be the most solid in their relationship. They seem to be really on the same accord, but goes to show, you know, time reveals things and they uh, ended up having to do long distance. They needed to do long distance between Ireland and London and that seemed to have really dissolved their relationship and communication. I don't understand that because like we live in the time of FaceTime and phone calls and online calendar. I don't know. I just, I understand. I've never been in a long distance relationship so I'm really speaking out of turn but I've had a lot of friends who have been in international <laughs> long distance relationship. So I've witnessed people do the work or did the work to maintain that relationship until they were able to be in person with their partner. And I think, damn, y'all were together a year. And from what I understand, they separated within four months. Did you really try? <laughs> I don't know. Another situation, we don't know the relationship. So maybe that is the best for them. And yeah, long distance isn't ideal, but I, I don't know. Again, I might be speaking out of turn. Comment down below on your opinions on that. But I really didn't see that coming. That was fascinating. Bobby and Jasmine are still together and happy. Didn't, didn't see that one coming either. But I'm, again here to admit when I'm wrong. And apparently her mom has come around to it as well. So that's good. Tom and Maria are not back together, but they seem amicable. Well, not really, because she goes into the frustration she felt after he had said no, because in his post interview, as she took it, he was insinuating that gender dynamics that she was raised with would be harmful to whatever child they end up having. That insinuated that my upbringing and how my parents raised me was not okay. Like he was indirectly insulting my family. When it comes to raising my kids, I want to replicate what my mother has done because she's raised kind kids, confident kids, kids who... He sounds very close-minded in a lot of ways. She sounds very close-minded in a lot of ways. And they didn't have enough time to actually talk about that. I'm not surprised that it didn't work out and it didn't seem that they were under the impression that that's something they really needed to hone in on, at least on camera. So whatever, it didn't work. That's fine. It didn't need to. But Naya and Nicole are still together. They seem happy. They bring out Sam um, and people kind of confront him, but it's not really that great. He ends up chalking it all up to nerves, essentially. And it's very frustrating. Um, it's very stupid and not satisfying at all. And finally, Freddie and Kat aren't together, but they... I think they're friends of some sort or at least again amicable so good for them but as far as you know reunions go this one was pretty anticlimactic or wasn't that interesting I wanted more fights I'm used to that in the U.S. brand of stuff but it seems that most of the issues that happen with couples uh happen off camera which in real life ideal but not great for reality tv because I want it mess but also I respect y'all do what y'all need to do for y'all relationships. Okay. But yes, that's all for today, folks. How do you feel about all of this and the reunion that I've definitely watched as I'm speaking right now? <laughs> but uh, what are your feelings for this season? If you've watched it, what are your feelings from my videos? Feel free to put those down in the comment section. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Do you think I'm wrong and I don't know what I'm talking about? You should like angrily leave me a comment about it. I think it would be kind of hot. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Send me things that you think I should watch. I did see a few things that have caught my attention. I did see several movies in theaters right now that have that just sound f terrible for different reasons. I'm deciding whether or not I want to wait until they're streaming. I'll see. But uh, the Colleen Hoover movie, it ends with us, which oy. M. Night Shyamalama Ding Dong has a new movie and I hear it's f terrible apparently the crow i don't know if that's out yet but i heard that's exceptionally bad i feel like people are making terrible movies just for me i'm egocentric enough to believe that it keeps things zesty it keeps us alive but uh yeah and i will see you guys next time